Eddard Stark rode through the towering bronze doors of the Red Keep, sore, tired, hungry, and irritable. Hi everybody, welcome to another edition of our rereading A Song of Us and Fire videos. This time we're with the chapter Ned 4 of the Game of Thrones book, when Ned arrives at King's Landing for the first time as the Hand of the King, the second most important post in the realm. There are many intriguing themes in this chapter. Still, I feel that most of them are very apparent and, and sometimes he does more telling than showing and hits us over the head with the insight we were able to garner for ourselves without him spelling it out. Like that in King's Landing, Ned is a fish out of water that he doesn't belong, doesn't like it there, doesn't know who he can trust. In rereading, it is also clear to us that almost all of the people in the capital lie to Ned virtually all the time. So to keep things interesting, I'll try not to repeat stuff you already know. So I want to focus today on a specific angle, the political causes of the upcoming Westerosi civil war as depicted in this chapter. I'm going to focus solely on the clues that appear in this chapter because this is a recurring theme that we will, sh that we will surely be able to revisit in future chapters. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, make sure to hit that subscribe button. If you're, if you're already subscribed and you enjoy these reading videos, then hit that bell and you'll get a notification whenever I post a new rereading video. I'd also like to thank Chuck, Christopher and NMK for supporting our channel through our Patreon page on patreon.com slash gotacademy. Thank you guys. So ruling let's talk about ruling he spends a lot of time in this book and in this series as a whole describing the different ways of governing and leading the different systems of government challenges and norms it is one of the crucial ingredients if not the main ingredient of this story because this is a story of a kingdom that is experiencing a traumatic political crisis as of this moment in ned 4 this crisis is looming and foreshadowed heavily. We are witnessing the small incremental steps and the context for the civil wars to come. According to Stanford political scientists, David Lighting and James Fearon, several factors make civil wars more likely. With the two most relevant ones for this chapter being that they're more that they're more likely to break out in impoverished and politically unstable regions impoverished and politically unstable regions that's pretty straightforward the specific grievances of the parties that take up arms are less important than the factors that, that make these internal wars possible and make them go on and wreak havoc it's not that the grievances are irrelevant, it's that solving a specific grievance apparently is not an assurance that the rebellion or conflict or war will stop. It might continue because of other factors, other grievances, or because the demands are a proxy for something else. Meaning that the political context in which these wars break out is what will determine if they are successful or not with successful being like uh, testing positive for uh, a certain uh, plague. So in order to gather this information, they have focused on internal wars since World War II. And since that time, there have not only been way more internal wars than conventional wars, but the formers have resulted in a lot more casualties than the latters and have gone on for much longer on average. So back to the Westerosi civil war. It is not here yet, but it will begin as an internal war between the North and the South. Some of the representatives of these two sides are the main characters of this chapter. Ned Stark, he represents the North. And most of the rest of the small council represent the South. Varys, Littlefinger, and Grand Maester Paisel. Mostly Littlefinger, and Grand Maester Paisel. Even though they have ulterior motives, some of them known, some of them unknown, their bases of power are in the south, thus de facto they are representing the south. As Ned arrives in King's Landing, he is urgently summoned to a small council meeting where he is amazed to learn that Robert is an absent king, 
that the crown is 6 million gold coins in debt, half of them to the Lannisters. So the crown is in the pocket of the wealthiest and most ambitious house in the South. That in itself is a precursor to a civil war. You cannot have a politically stable kingdom when a house that is not the crown, that is not the royal house, is the richest and strongest in the realm. In this first council meeting, Ned is shocked. Ned is further shocked to discover that the urgent issue at hand is not the debt or the political instability inherent in the realm, but rather that the king wants his government to organize a tournament and feast in honor of the new hand of the king, Ned. Mm. As I said earlier in the research, Lightning and Fearon focused on civil wars that happened after World War II. They wanted to look on post-colonial conflicts and see what were the causes that they broke out. And actually post-colonialism could apply to A Song of Ice and Fire in general and to this chapter in particular. The north of Westeros was colonized by the first men way back when, and then it was recolonized by the Andals, mostly in the south, but not exclusively. So you have in the north descendants of the first men, descendants of the Andals and the mixed. Mm. And later, the entire realm, including the north, was conquered again by a foreign invader, Aegon Targaryen, who put his family on top in a political entity that he has created out of several warring kingdoms. It is likely that even without Littlefinger's machinations, the end result would have been a civil war. In this Littlefinger, Tywin, Lannister world, Ned, Tyrion, Caitlyn, they're nothing but pawns, actors in a play someone else has written. They have no control over the foundational instabilities in the Seven Kingdoms. Okay, now get this. I'm going to quote directly from uh, their research. And it's super cool because we get to learn a lot by focusing on A Song of Ice and Fire. Hmm? Okay. The factors that explain which countries have been at risk for civil war are not their ethnic or religious characteristics, but rather the conditions that favor insurgency. Mm? These include extreme poverty, check. Political instability in new or failing states, check. Rough terrain enabling rebels to hide easily, oh well. There are plenty of insurgents later in the, later in the story, hiding in forests and mountains and caves and marshes and whatnot, check. Large populations, Check. External financing. Check. Littlefinger in this chapter states that on top of the debt to the Lannisters and to the Tyrells, the rivals, there's also money owed to the Iron Bank of Bravos. Okay, so on to the small council meeting. We see in that scene one other thing very relevant for the upcoming civil war and the political instability. And that is that the government doesn't have a plan, a purpose, a strategy, or even coherent policies? No. There are the whims of the king that they must respond to, react to, and there are fires that they need to put out. Mm. Nominally, the council members answer to the king, but we know that Pycelle answers to the Lannisters, and that Ned answers only to himself, as does Littlefinger. Varys' motives are still unclear. Renly, at this point, well, you know, who knows? Okay, let's put aside the civil war academics. We'll have plenty more time to delve into it. There are a lot of really, really cool stuff there for future chapters. Now let's talk about Ned. Let's talk about Ned. The first thing he orders his people before he goes to the council meeting is Arya is not to go exploring. The man knows his daughter. <laughs> when Ned enters the room of the small council, he's going into an ambush, as he did in his previous chapter when Arya was on trial for attacking the crown prince, and as he will when he'll confess by the end of this book of treason against King Joffrey, and as his wife and son will when they'll go into the Red Wedding. The council chambers are richly furnished and adorned and he describes in great detail all the beautiful things in there and where they come from. From Mir, the Summer Isles, Norvos, Lys, and Kohor. There are also Valyrian sphinxes, 
sphinxes come on george is there an egypt in this world hmm? maybe pick something else that wouldn't take us out of our suspension of disbelief anyways there are valyrian sphinxes flanking the door with eyes of polished garnet smoldering in black marble faces there are also statues made up of fabulous beasts cavorted <laughs> <laughs> All of this is obviously the polar opposite of, no of the North and Winterfell. Can these two starkly different political traditions coexist? Can they work together? Ned does try to be diplomatic and play the game, and he is quick to realize that there is a game. He's not as stupid as it seems in hindsight, but he's making calculations based on personal preferences without thinking things through. For example, he says he likes Varys the least. Who the fuck cares who you like? This is not a popularity contest. Varys is the most trustworthy of the bunch. And he agonizes a little bit over partnering up with Littlefinger, whom he dislikes. You have a lot of reasons to distrust Littlefinger. If he rubs you the wrong way, that's, that's not one of the reasons. To do anything with regards to Littlefinger. I liked this chapter's various bits best. He's accosting Ned. I was grievous sad to hear all about your troubles on the King's Road. We have all been visiting the Sep to light candles for Prince Joffrey. I pray for his recovery. His hand left powder stains on Ned's sleeve and he smelled as foul and as sweet as flowers on a grave. Wow, nice. <laughs> Your gods have heard you, Ned replied. Cool yet polite. The prince grows stronger every day. He disentangled himself from the eunuch's grip. Nice again. Ned is being very formal with the council members while they banter and faux praise and, and talk smack. Ned describes Littlefinger as a short man with a smile that borders on insolence. He's sly and arrogant, and at one point, Ned says that he saunters. <laughs> Basically, Peter is, in my eyes, testing Ned throughout the chapter, throwing curveballs and pestering him with jabs all the way to the end. Ned is not used to tolerating this kind of behavior from people in, from people in power or from anybody. He is the one who appoints his own government, and they serve at his pleasure. Well, not here. And that also informs our first part of the video about the inherent instability in the realm that will allow the internal wars to break out and flourish. Here in the south, they say you are all made of ice and melt when you ride below the neck. I do not plan on melting soon, Lord Baelish. You may count on it. That is indeed very much insolent. Then George boy goes off his game when he puts words of explanation into Ned's mouth, saying that Ned is tired of, of this dueling of words. That's telling, George. That's not showing. Hmm? He's an even worse example. It says about Ned, he had no taste for these intrigues, but he was beginning to realize that they were meat and mead to a man like Littlefinger. Ay, 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 face palm. That might be the worst line of the book as of now. Hmm? Up to here. Still more banter between Ned and Lord Baelish. When Ned evokes his brother Brandon, for a second time in an effort to hurt Littlefinger's feelings, as Brandon is the one who beat him up and got the girl, hmm? Peter's reply is, I'm still alive and your brother is dead. Ouch! <laughs> I would not shut up about that. No, no. My hands would do the talking <laughs> if I were Ned. But Ned, he keeps his cool. And then Peter goes on. If you are so eager to molder beside him, him being Brandon, far be it for me to dissuade you, but I would rather not be included in the party. Thank you very much. 
So, what he's doing, he's knocking Ned off his game and he's playing the rope a dope. Ned, Ned, of course, is quick to say, You would be the last person I would include in any party, Lord Baelish. Oh, boom, smack. <laughs> and then Caitlin goes, like, Ah, by the way, I told Littlefinger everything. Basically, Littlefinger's plan is to make Ned believe that going against the Lannisters was Ned's idea all along. When Littlefinger suggests that Ned should just do nothing and just drop it. Ned is outraged. Mm. Ned regarded him coldly. Lord Baelish, I am a Stark of Winterfell. My son lies crippled, perhaps dying. He would be dead and Caitlin with him, but for a wolf pup we found in the snow. If you truly believe, I could forget that. You are as big a fool now as when you took up sword against my brother. He's playing you, Ned. He's playing you. Littlefinger does reveal a weakness when he says to Ned that Caitlyn surely mentioned him. Right, right. She must have said something about me. Hmm? If I were Ned, I would plead ignorance. Um, I'm not sure. Remind me, please, who you are. Maybe, maybe I'm misremembering. I'm sure she has. I'm just my memory, you know. I'm 35. That's very old. So the way that things progress is that after the Council of Littlefinger, Littlefinger leads Ned to the brothel, to his brothel, where Caitlyn is. But he's doing it in the most douchey way possible to get Ned out of his comfort zone and, see, and to see what comes up. Hmm. Well, after going in and around and clamping down, what comes up is Ned's knife to Littlefinger's throat. But Ned is not all stupid. When Caitlyn thanks Littlefinger for his help, brotherly help, Peter replies, Best not tell anyone. I have spent years convincing the court that I am wicked and cruel, and I should hate to see all that work go for naught. Ned believed not a word of that, but he kept his voice polite. Good instincts there, Ned. After that, Ned orders Caitlin, and I did not remember that, to go back to the north and prepare the north for war. Call up some banners, block the neck, fortify white harbor and keep a watchful eye on Theon because they'll need him if there's a war. The chapter ends when the two lovebirds say goodbye. Until they meet again. Hmm. Caitlin wants to see the girls. Ned says, I'll take care of the girls. And you take care of the boys. They embrace as if to keep Ned safe forever and that's it for this chapter and also that's it for this video thank you everybody for tuning in next up is Tyrion 3 subscribe to get it bye everybody